this is when you do not want to be my child, okay? And this is when, the other night Dusty came out, I do not help my kids with their homework only because I'm like kind of stupid, I guess. At third grade, when I did not understand their math, I realized we were going to have a problem. So I told them lovingly that their teachers were paid to teach them, not their mother. So that's worked so far. He's now a freshman. He came out the other night and said, Mom, I really need you to help me um, with this test. And I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> like, I don't have time for this. And he's like, Mom, most parents help their children. <laughs> and most parents actually do the homework for their kids. And I'm like, yeah, well, that's not going to happen in this house. So hand me over the test. Wrong test for him to, you know. So this is, this is the questions. What is the Big Bang Theory? Really? Honestly? <laughs> so he starts telling me. That, show. Yeah, that, that's what I told him. So I go, isn't that a TV show? <laughs> and Okay, here, uh, let's see. He, according to scientists, approximately how old is the universe? So he gives me, and I said, and then I pretended like I was reading a question. According to the Bible, how old is the universe? And he was like, Dad, r they both rolled their eyes at me. Uh, so I, I just started answering the questions for him. What was the first atoms, and how did they form? Jesus. Ex <laughs> explain how the sun and our solar system formed. Jesus. <laughs> how did the stars begin? Jesus, <laughs> exactly. But I was like, are you kidding? I said, do you understand that everything you are being taught is not true? He goes, I know. He goes, but mom, if I put down Jesus on my test, I'm going <laughs> to fail. <laughs> so I said, okay. So I'm going to assume he's never going to ask me to help him with his homework again, which works for me really, really good. So, okay, let's go on. Last week, we talked about Mary. She went to Elizabeth. And we talked a little bit last week about encouragement and how uh, Mary needed to be encouraged. She needed to know that she heard from God. And Elizabeth was there to help her do that. And um, we saw last week how Mary had to move from anxiety, where she heard she was going to be the mother of God, basically. And she was very uh, fearful for the moment. And she moved from anxiety to um, acceptance, where we have to accept our situations, and then to worship, saying, God, thank you for my situation. I know you have a purpose beyond what, what you're doing here. So now the story is going to continue, and at this point, we have no idea if Mary stayed long enough to see Elizabeth have her baby, which of course is going to be John the Baptist as we know him. And the scene is going to shift back to Elizabeth and Zechariah. Now we talked about them probably the very, very first part of when we started Luke. Zechariah and Elizabeth were, were an elderly couple, way past childbearing age, and all she ever wanted was a baby, and God said no for some weird reason. And this, uh, he was in the temple, he was a priest, he went to the temple, and on this particular day, he got chosen for this lot. You get to do it once in your lifetime. It was the one time that God said, now it's your turn to go and go in and trim the wick on the candle in, near into the inner holy place, uh, where he was closest he felt to God. So you have in the temple this one place where the priests would go and, and do their thing. So he got chosen to do that, and as he was in there, he got to uh, meet an angel, the angel Gabriel, and the angel Gabriel gave him some really awesome news saying, uh, I am Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God, which is like the coolest angel in the whole world, and he says, I, am, um, I have some news for you that you're going to have a baby, and Zechariah did not believe him. He just said, well, it's not really possible, and I, I need some more proof, and because of that, God rendered Zechariah mute until this baby was born because of his lack of belief and he doubted and, and, and all those things. Uh, I was thinking about this the other day about being a parent. They were probably 90 years old, I would say, let's just say. And Rob is now 62 and I hit 53 this year, okay? I cannot imagine, like, we're, we're trying to be the really cool parents, so we go to the rec center with them every afternoon and we play basketball with them, okay? So I decided I would be the really cool mom and shoot, like, like, free throws. I pulled every muscle <laughs> out of my neck the other day. I'm like, okay, I'm too old. Yesterday, Rob's running after the balls, and he got in bed last night, and he goes, I need some Advil. <laughs> so we're way too old to have children that are 14 playing basketball. So I cannot imagine good old Zachariah and Elizabeth at 80 or 90 years old having a baby. It just, to me, it's just beyond me. But 
Anyway, that's not the point. The point is, I want to talk first, before we even get into Luke, a little bit about discipline. Because oh, I hate that, and I didn't even put that on the thing, because I knew if I put that on there, no one would show up today. So, you get to hear it. But I want to show you that, that as Christians, that God does discipline us if we're his children. And no one likes that. I don't like it. I hate to discipline my kids. But we see it all through the Bible. And it starts with all the way back with Adam and Eve. God says, don't eat the fruit from this tree, and they do, and what happens? They get nixed out of the garden, she has to have pain in childbirth, and he has to work for a living now. So there's consequences, and God says your discipline for this is going to be this. So we have to know this going into this, that as a Christian, as a child of God, if in fact we decide we're going to sin, he is going to discipline us. That's just the way it is. Uh, Lot's wife, um, God said don't turn around and look at the city. And she turned around and looked at the city and she became a pillar of salt. Okay? It's kind of like God doesn't mess around with this kind of stuff. We see Moses. God says, speak to that rock. And Moses was having a really bad day and he hit the rock. And because he did that, God said, you're not going into the promised land. Now that to me is a little harsh, but that's God's deal. He's saying, Moses, you know me. We have this really great relationship. When I tell you to do something, just do it because I have my reasons for doing it. You don't need to get mad and fussy and slap the rock or do whatever. You don't have to do that. You just got to do what I say, and life works really, really good. Uh, we have Abraham. God says, you're going to have a baby. And he's like, yeah, I don't think so. His wife didn't believe him. She says, I think that we should have you have sex with my maid. And then because of that, we'll have another child because God evidently isn't going to come through. And of course, we know now the whole Arab nation comes from his one son, and um, Jesus, the line of is Israel, is Jewish people come from the, um, his other son, Isaac. So, but during that, when this happened, we see a lot of conflict with his, with his wife, with Sarah, with Hagar, with all these children. His life is a disaster for the rest of his life because he refused to believe God. And God says, because of that, there's going to be consequences. And I kind of want us to, to see that today. We look at David, King David, a man after God's own heart. He says, David, I would give you anything you want. And David says, yeah, well, the only thing I want is that really hot woman bathing on the roof and she's married, but I want her. God's like, yeah, that's not in my plan for you, so David does it anyway. And because of that, she gets pregnant, he kills the husband, his baby dies, his whole, his whole world is rocked, his kids are dysfunctional, it's a nightmare the rest of his life because of disobedience. And, and I think that the problem is that we see all through the Bible saying, I just want you to do this one thing. And that's obey me. Do what I ask you to do. But apparently, we are a lot like the people in the Bible because we don't want to. God says, don't gossip. It's way much more fun to gossip. Why would I not? Okay, because he's saying, because it's harmful. I don't want it to hurt you. I don't want it to hurt other people. Just do what I say. Don't commit adultery. But I don't think I love my husband anymore. And I don't think that I think this other guy loves me. So I'm going to, God's going, don't do it. it. It's like a hurricane or a tornado. You see this destruction that just flies through. And when you do something against what God says to do, there's going to be serious consequences. He says, go to church and learn my word. I'm too busy for that. It's real simple. Just go and learn. And, and we're like, yeah, I'm kind of too busy. It's interesting because this weekend, I, I learned this, that we have, to, we have to make the time to do the things that God calls us to do. We had a basketball game at um, 1 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and 7 o'clock. And it was way down Avondale Way. And so it's like, okay, we, oh, we have a decision to make here. Do we just blow off church because we're too busy? And I think we've come to the point of saying, look, God calls us to worship. And so we have to do that regardless of whether, and we had to fly back over at 4.30, go to the service, get back in the car, run back over there for a seven o'clock game. We have to make concessions because we want to do what God calls us to do for our own good. Uh, we see, he says, love, love your enemy. We're like, I don't want to love my enemy. They deserve everything they get. God's going, no, because if you don't love them, it's going to be harmful to you. So behind everything that God disciplines us, he has a really, really good purpose for that. 
Um, so we're really no different from the men and women of the Bible. And th the problem is, is that we want to do our own thing because it really does feel better. It, it feels much better to go have the affair and gossip and do those things than to do what God calls us to do. So I just want to make sure that we know that when in fact we do go against what God calls us to do, we're, there's going to be consequences. So if you're thinking about having an affair, if you're thinking about doing, I'm just forewarning you here, please don't do it because it's not going to bring good things. You think like, oh, it's going to work. No, it won't. Trust me. If you're a Christian, a child of God, you'll be disciplined more than you will ever know. You don't want that. So, okay, handout, page one. Your first verse there is John 14, 23 and 24. It says, Jesus answered, if a person really loves me, he will keep my word, obey my teaching, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make him our home, abode, special dwelling place with him. Anyone who does not really love me does not observe and obey my teachings, and the teaching which you hear and heed is not mine, but comes from the Father who sent me. So Jesus says very clearly, if in fact you are my children, that you're going to obey me. That's just what Christians do. And, and sometimes we don't, we learn, but this is the words of Jesus when he says that. John 14, 15. If you really love me, you will keep and obey my commands. And then 1 John 5, 3 says, For the true love of God is this, that we do his commands, keep his ordinances, and are mindful of his precepts and teaching. And these orders are his, are not irksome, burdensome, oppressive, or grievous. So he's saying, as a Christian, when God says, don't gossip, don't commit adultery, we're not back there going, oh, this is miserable. How could you ask me to do these things, God? This is ridiculous. We don't say that. We're just like, thank you, God, that you have a reason for why you're telling me to do this. Now, a man by the name of David Dave Stone wrote this next thing, and I thought it was a really good point about obedience. And, and it's in your handout. It says, a number of years ago, our family was in the Dominican Republic on a mission trip. If you've ever driven in a developing country, you know how dangerous the traffic can be. Vehicles whizzed past, coming within just a few feet of children playing close to the road. One night, my son Sam was playing a game in his own little world in which he would zig and zag back and forth from sidewalk onto the narrow street and back. It wasn't a heavily traveled road, but there was a always loud music blaring. It was a pitch dark. From about 10 feet away, I suddenly shouted, Samuel, don't move. Immediately he froze. About a second later, a moped zipped past him, going 30 miles an hour with no lights on it, right where Sam was about to step. My six-year-old son didn't ignore me, argue, or blatantly disobey. I said, freeze, and he froze, and that obedience probably saved his life. Now, I love that, because in this, he, he wrote two things there, that, that it has a couple different, we could use this illustration a couple ways. As parents, we could say that our ch our, we've got to get our children to obey us like the first time. The thing that drives me crazy, and if you do it, it's, I'm not saying this because I know you or know that you do this, but there's nothing that drives me more crazy than parents that'll say, I'm going to count to three, okay? I ca Here's my deal. I'm going to tell you, and if you don't, I'm going to ground you, smack you, whatever it takes, okay? Because I want you to understand that, that it's very important that you listen to me the first time. What if Lot's wife did that? Okay, God, could you imagine God saying, don't turn around and look at the city. I'm going to count to three. She goes, one, two, and then suddenly he, he, she obeys a third time. And, and God's the same way. He's like, I want you to listen to me because I know what's best for you. If this child did not listen to his father immediately, he could have been dead, okay? So there's just, there's just really consequences to all that. He wants, God wants our obedience the first time, and there's lots of effects if we don't do it. Dusty was funny the other day. We, we asked him to do something. I don't know if it was like go take out the garbage or, or whatever it was. And he walks by and he says, I just can't wait to have my own kids so I can boss them around. Okay. <laughs> So I started laughing and I said, really? I said, you're right, Dusty. That's exactly why we had you. Like we decided to have children so that we could boss you around. That's our goal in life, okay? And, uh, but some people think that. They're like, I don't like God because he wants to tell me what to do. Yeah, he does because he has a good plan for your life. But he doesn't make us our children so he can just boss us around. But he makes us his children so we, he can lovingly teach us things along the way so that we can go out in the world and have a bigger impact for him. I mean, it's, it's real simple. It's not, it's not really a, a bad thing. So, so the ca case of Zechariah, God wanted his belief, but honestly, if an angel showed up to me, I would be fearful. I would be a lot more like Zechariah than Mary. Mary just said, thank you, God. I'll do whatever you want. Amen. 
Okay, Zachariah was a little more questioning. I would be probably that. I would say I'd be like, where's Candid Camera? Where's Ashton Kutcher with his like punk show? Like I would be looking for something going, this doesn't seem right, it doesn't feel right. So I might fall under the Zachariah thing and then I would be mute, which might not be a bad, <laughs> might not be a bad thing. So, um, but I think we have to realize that. But anyway, but God didn't tell Zechariah anything that he didn't know. And I think that's the problem. We all read our Bibles. We wake up in the morning, we read, we come to Bible study, we go to church. We know this stuff, and yet we still don't want to obey. Zechariah knew that the next thing coming onto the scene was going to be the forerunner to Jesus. So when the angel told him that, it should have clicked immediately with him and said, oh, that's me, this is so cool. But instead... He decided to doubt and do all that. And because of that, God disciplined him. So uh, I want to just explain why God disciplines us. Uh, I'm a parent, and the reason why we do it to our kids is just to make them grow up, to grow up, to be responsible adults, and that's what God wants us to do. We just had this with Dusty the other night. We were going, he, he had a friend that was coming over, and we were at church and then right after church she started arguing with Rob about something and just started being really disrespectful. Rob said, you're not having your friend come over. And he was like, what? And I was like, what? <laughs> okay. um, but it, it made sense. He said, Lisa, if we don't stop this now and we, if we don't give him any consequence, he's going to be like, oh, I can just pop off and be disrespectful of my dad anytime. No, you can't. But it's hard. Discipline is so hard. And I wonder if when God disciplines us, it's very, very hard for him too. But I think the thing is, is that I don't want Dusty to be 30 years old and have a snotty little attitude, okay? But I got to correct it when he's 14. And God does the same thing with us. It's like, I want you to be a responsible child of mine, and so I'm going to discipline you. We went out of town once, and I remember telling the kids, please, please be good, because you are a reflection of me, okay? And if you're lying and screaming and hitting people and doing stuff, okay, that says I evidently am not a very good parent. I'm not teaching you the right thing. So you are a reflection of me. And I think that's the same thing with God. He's saying you as Christians, my children, are our reflection of him. And he wants us to be good reflections of him, not bad ones. Page two on your handout, Hebrews 12, 5 through 11. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons, my son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. He scourges every son whom he receives. Now, I, the reason why I like that is because it tells me that when God disciplines me, it, I know I'm his. If you can sin and sin and sin and sin and never feel God any conviction or anything, then you might need to question, am I really a child of God? Because God promises right here, if you are my child, I will discipline you. That's just the way it's going to be. He said, verse 8, but if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as seem best to them, but his discipline, he disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful, yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So God promises that the reason why he does it is to train us and that we'll have, it's a good thing when we're all done. I love Psalm 32, three through five, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groanings all day long, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide and said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. See, when I pop off and say something really stupid or I, 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 I'm, I'm frustrated with Rob or I get angry with one of the kids or I do something like that, immediately, I, God doesn't even give me 10 seconds anymore. It's like suddenly his hand is really heavy on me and he's like, that's enough, okay? And that's not even good and I don't want you to do that and I need you to go apologize and I need you to make this right because we're not doing that anymore, okay? So, and I get trained by that. So before I pop off my mouth or get grumpy with Rob or do whatever, I think twice about it because I know if I say something, God's gonna put his hand on me and I'm gonna be like, now I have to go apologize. So apologizing is almost worse than just having to actually do it. So I just, I've learned that 
that's not a good. So we, we, we have two choices always, always, always in our life. We can either do the path of least resistance or the hard way. And, and we need to learn to go God's way, do things the hard way, don't gossip, don't commit adultery, don't do those things, forgive our friends, whatever it is, because that's, that's the, the place that God wants us to be. We live on this, this back road, and it's, it's a dirt road. When I go to my house, I can either turn right or I can turn left. And if I turn right, I'm on a dirt road. The dirt road gives us probably one flat tire a month, okay? It destroys our cars. We've broken tie rods. We've broken whatever. The reason I go that way is because it saves me 15 minutes, okay? 15 minutes out of my life, but I go that way. But when I go that way, there's a whole lot of consequences. But when I go to the left, it takes me 15 minutes longer, but it's peaceful and it's easy and, it's, and uh, there's not a lot of stress going that way. And I think it's just a good illustration to show we, we have that choice every day if I'm running late. This morning I forgot something. I had to go back home and get it, get back in my car. I get to that point, hmm, if I go right, I might get there faster, but I might get a flat tire. So those are our options in, in life. And, and I want, I've det- determined I want my life to be more, more peaceful than I was. Um, I, I'm gonna, I was going to tell you this story, but I don't think I'm going to. I, I will at the end if we have time. Your next verse is Second Chronicles 21, verse 12. And, and I'm not going to go through it, but I will tell you in case I don't have time to go back to it. Somebody called, ta- told me the other day that they had a hemorrhoid, okay? I've never had a hemorrhoid, but he said it was really like the most painful thing in the whole world. But anyway, he was reading his Bible, and this came up, and he realized why he doesn't want to disobey God. So I'll, I'll come back and read that if we have time, but I, I want to move on. Okay. <laughs> um, L- Luke, L- Luke 1, 57. Let's just head that. It's on page four of your handout. Now we'll actually go back and talk about Elizabeth. Elizabeth, yay, she's going to have a baby today. So we have verse 57. It says, now the time that Elizabeth should be, de- should be, de- I wonder if I can read. Now the time that Elizabeth should be delivered came and she gave birth to a son and her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy on her and they rejoiced with her. And it occurred that on the eighth day when they came to circumcise the child, they were intending to call him Zechariah after his father. But his mother answered, not so, but he shall be called John. And they said to her, none of your relatives is called by that name. And they inquired with signs to his father as to what he wanted to have him be called. Then Zechariah asked for a writing tablet, and he wrote, his name is John. And they were all astonished, and at once his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed, and he began to speak, blessing and praising and thanking God. So finally, Zechariah does exactly what God tells him to do, name your son John, and he does it. And his mouth is open. And the, the most amazing thing to me at that is that when God disciplines me, the first thing out of my mouth isn't usually praise and worship for God. It's usually serious, like I'm miserable and that was miserable and I didn't deserve that and why did you do that and you're mean. And I, I mean, those would be my first thoughts. But for Zechariah, the first thing that comes out of his mouth is this praise to God for just who he is. He, he said, well, I can't even go to that because we didn't even finish that whole thing I was going to tell you about, but never mind. Okay, verse 65. And awe and reverential fear came on all their neighbors, and all of these things were discussed throughout the hills, hill country of Ju- Judea. Now, when I read that, it made me think, now, my brother went to Africa. I know I told this story. I cannot remember if I told it in Luke or Revelation. I can't find it in any of my notes. So if I'm going to tell you it again, and then you're going to go, oh yeah, you already told me this, which is, I know that. I just don't know where I told it to you. But it made me realize that when, some, when God does something really amazing, how important it is that it, it gets out there. So when God does something in your life or my life, and we tell people, it's so exciting, and it builds people's faith, and it gets them excited about God. So my brother went to Africa, and he was on a plane at some point with a, with a man who has an orphanage over there. And the guy was in the United States, and, and he said that God spoke to him and said, I, I need you to go and start an orphanage in Africa. And he said, I don't, have no mon- I don't have any money. And he said, go to the airport. Money will be waiting. He said, I just obeyed God, went to the airport. Someone walked up and said, are you trying to get to Africa? And he said, I have a ticket for you. Hand in the ticket. He went to Africa, started an orphanage. Okay. Now, 
a few things about that that frustrates me because I want to hear from God like that. And when I don't, it makes me think why I'm not hearing from God. But for him, so when I hear that, it builds my faith. And I want to tell everyone, I want to tell you guys, this is how awesome our God is. He's so awesome because he does these really cool things and he heals marriages and he, 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 he financially gave us money when we didn't think we were going to make it. And God's just like that. And so when I hear a story and I get to tell you, then it excites you and then you get to go out and tell your friends. And that's kind of what's going on here. Zechariah, his mouth is open. He's praising God. His son is born. And it says people were astonished and it, it, that went out through all of the land. In that thing that I told you about Africa, which I think I told you, but I can't remember if I told you, there, there was a scene where or he was saying, my brother was telling me about the, the uh, he told this guy, you need to go pray for somebody in this medical place. And he went over there and he walked in and he said, someone needs prayer. And it was a group of Muslim people and they said, no, get out, no one needs prayer. Back of the room, finally a dad said, my son needs prayer. He goes over there, prays for him. His son's like paralyzed. God heals him right there. So when I hear stories like that, it gets me really excited because I know we have a big God who can do anything. And if you're here today and you're thinking, my God is really small and he's not going to fix this problem, he will. Just do the right thing. Don't do stupid things like Lot and David and Moses. Do, do the right thing. Pick the right choices and then God can bless that. Verse 66. Um, and all who heard them laid them up in their hearts, at saying, whatever will this little boy be then? For the hand of the Lord was so evidently with him, protecting and abiding, aiding him. Now Zechariah, his father, was filled with and controlled by the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, and then he goes through this whole thing of, of what he, his just prayer to God, his thankfulness. And we read it, we'll read it real quick, and then I want to go back to he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He said in verse 68, Blessed, praised, and extolled, and thanked be the Lord, of God, the God of Israel, because he has come and brought deliverance and redemption to his people. And he has raised up a horn of salvation, a mighty and valiant helper, the author of salvation for us in the house of David, his servant. This is, his, is as he promised by the mouth of his holy prophets from the most ancient times in the memory of man that we should have been delivered and be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who detest and pursue us with hatred to make true and show mercy and compassion and kindness promised to our forefathers and to remember and carry out his holy covenant to bless which is all the more sacred because it is made by God himself that covenant he sealed by oath to our forefather Abraham to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our foes might serve him fearlessly in holiness, divine consecration, and righteousness, in accordance with the everlasting principles of right, within his presence all the days of our life. And then he starts talking about his son. And you, little one, shall be called a prophet of the Most High, for you shall go on before the face of the Lord to make ready his ways, to bring and give the knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness and remission of their sins. Because of and through the heart of tender mercy and loving kindness of our God, a light from on high will dawn upon us and visit us to shine upon us and give us light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to direct and guide our feet in a straight line way into the way of peace. So for Zechariah, this was like the most amazing thing. Suddenly he, his mouth opens with this whole thing of praise saying, God, you're awesome and you're bringing us a savior and this is so cool. And my son, my little baby is going to be the one who gets to introduce him to the world. And for Zechariah, he had nine months to put all these pieces together and it comes together with this song of praise for what God has done for him. It's like my little baby boy, he's going to be like ahead of the Messiah. And the little boy grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the desert's wilderness until the day of his appearing to Israel, the commencement of his public ministry. So that's Zechariah, that's Elizabeth, that's John the Baptist. He's being born now. And so I want to go back to talking about what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit, because this is kind of an important thing in, in our life. Uh, it says that John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit when he was in his mother's womb. Elizabeth, it says, was filled by the Holy Spirit when she proclaimed this prophetic message to Mary, to giving her the encouragement that she needs. You have Zechariah being filled with the Holy Spirit as he is just worshiping God. And see, the Holy Spirit does different things in our life. So if you have never uh, understood about the Holy Spirit, or if you're new, you're a new Christian, you're like, I don't even understand what that means. What, what it is is, is that, that the Holy Spirit's job is to do different things in different people, okay? And we'll talk about what that means, but if you've never studied him, it, it's, it can be very frustrating because you turn on channel 21 and you see 
people doing weird things and you hear the Holy Ghost and then you think, okay, he's a ghost and then that's confusing and, and then people are speaking in weird languages and then someone hits someone on the head and then they fall over and it's all supposedly the Holy Spirit and so now everyone's really totally confused on what in the world that actually means. So I want to tell you who the Holy Spirit is. He's the third person in the Trinity. Uh, so we have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, when we talk about that, we're saying there's one God in three different persons that, that make up God. Wayne Grudem, on top of your page seven, in his systematic theology, he says this, because it's kind of important to understand who he is. He says, first it is important to affirm that each person, he's talking about God, is completely and fully God. That is that each person has the whole fullness of God being in himself. The Son is not partly God, or just one third of God, but the Son is wholly and fully God, and so is the Father and the Holy Spirit. We must say that the person of the Father possesses the whole being of God in himself. Similarly, the Son possesses the whole being of God and the Holy Spirit possesses the whole being of God. When we speak of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together, we are not speaking of any greater being than when we speak of the Father alone and the Son. Now, for me, my thing is that I always felt like God the Father was up here and then Jesus was down here and they listened and then the Holy Spirit was kind of like and that was just he just kind of floated around and he lived in us and whatever and so to me I always felt like God the Father was the main guy the son and so I've never really thought about it as they're all being completely totally equally God and so when I read that this week I, I guess I really never thought about it when I read it, it made me more excited for being a Christian and having the Holy Spirit live within me. Because now I'm like, oh my gosh, I have the fullness of God living within me to change me and do whatever he needs to do inside of my life. It, people go, I don't understand the Trinity. Well, yeah, welcome to the crowd. But the thing is, is that it's like when Rob and I get married, God says the two shall become one. I don't know how that works. We're two different people, but we're one flesh. That's what God says we are. So in that sense, it kind of makes sense to go, yeah, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, there's three of them, but they're one God. So however that works. Now, the Holy Spirit's been here since the beginning. G Genesis 1, verse 1 and 2 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the water. So he was here since the beginning. He was part of the whole process of the whole world. Here's a few things that the Holy Spirit does. He comforts us. So he brings to remembrance scripture. Uh, let's just say, uh, for me, I'll be studying and then all of a sudden a scripture will come to my mind and I'll be like, oh, I haven't thought about that forever. That's a perfect thing to put in there. Okay, I don't, I'm not that brilliant. Okay, so that's God, the Holy Spirit living, working in me, bringing me remembrance to something. Um, for those of you that have tragedy or something that's happened in your life and you've just felt this overwhelming comfort that you knew could not be produced on your own, that would be the Holy Spirit. He, he draws us to Jesus. So basically, if you and I are a Christian, it is because the Holy Spirit took us, opened our eyes, gave us a desire for him, and drew us to himself. And he gives us the power over addictions and struggles and things like that. That's where we get our power from. Um, Wayne Grudem also says of the Holy Spirit's work, the work of the Holy Spirit is to manifest the active presence of God in the world and especially the church. So it's the Holy Spirit's job to, to come inside of us and then give us this presence as Christians all over this world. Now, I want to focus on just a couple things before we're done here. Uh, he, he gives us the strength, the Holy Spirit's job is to give us the strength to do what he calls us to do because he gives us each a job. For Zechariah, he gave him the ability to just praise and worship. Some of you go to churches like that. Everything is just about worship and praise, and your hands are raised, and you're you're just wor and, and that's just the Holy Spirit just giving you the ability to be able to do that. For Elizabeth, he gave her the ability to encourage and prophesy over Mary. So he gave her the ability to do something that maybe maybe she wasn't even an encourager, but that's what the Holy Spirit does. He comes in and does that. For John the Baptist, he gave him the strength to be bold and to go out there and say, repent, repent. And he eventually got his head chopped off because of it, but the bottom line is that the Holy Spirit gave him everything he needed to do to do that. Um, my daughter-in-law, um, Val, she's not here today, she she's got, God has called her to be a mom, okay? All my daughter-in-law's daughter, they're all really great moms. Val, on the other hand, has this little William, we call him. That's his name. <laughs> I guess that's why we call him William. <laughs> uh, he is literally the cutest thing in the whole world, but he is 
enough to drive her nuts, okay? They sent a video the other night of him in the, the seat in the grocery store basket, screaming, like it was screaming his ever-loving head off. And she just, and God just gives her the patience to be able to deal with him. Because sometimes we have really difficult husbands, children, whatever, and it's God that is going to give you the strength to be able to go through. And that's what the Holy Spirit's job is to do. Because in her own strength, my daughter-in-law probably would want to kick him through the wall and give him, and, and give him up for adoption, okay? Because there's nothing more stressful than a child that's just that makes you crazy, okay? He's so cute. And I keep telling her, this too shall pass. He'll grow out of it. He's just, he's just two, I think. <laughs> he's two? Okay. Well, however old he is, he's, yeah, whatever. Okay, so, so anyway, for those of you that are here, you may be in a loveless marriage, and, and the Holy Spirit's going to give you the love you need to stay and make it work. He just will. You just need to consistently be praying, God, give me a love for this person. God, you live inside of me. You're God. You can do anything, so give me the love for him. Um, for me, I always laugh because I, I don't know, I would never be doing this if it weren't for the Holy Spirit because I don't know how to do this. I've never in my life, I took a speech class in high school and I went to a speech competition and this is what I learned from that. They said, oh, you look like Barbara Streisand and so therefore you should do a little blurb from Funny Girl. Okay, so I learned two things. Quit speech and get a nose job, okay? <laughs> so that all worked for me, but it's like, that's my one thing I learned from speech. I don't have any, I don't know how to get up and speak. I don't know how to do any of that. But it's kind of like, I don't know how to write a book, but somehow God just put on our hearts what needed to be written. I, the perfect example. I, and this is going to sound self-serving, but it's not. I love our Holy Land book, okay? I think it's the coolest book ever. That's just, because it's not, I, I don't know how it came about. Um, I was, we're working with a tour company and I was talking to her on the phone and I was doing this lesson and I, I looked at the Holy Land book and I actually started laughing. And I said, God, this is how awesome you are. This book is because of you. Like I couldn't have done it. I wouldn't know how to do any of that. But now we have this really cool book and every ounce of everything goes back to God. He did it. The Holy Spirit put upon my heart to do, gave me the ability. I don't have any ability to do that. I don't have any ability to do this, but God just says, this is what I want you to do, and I'm going to just work with you along the way, and that's his job. So we just need to figure out what it is that our job needs to be. I had lunch with Chris. I always talk about Chris because she and I have completely different things in our life. She, her goal in life, she goes to a Bible study on Thursday, is to take every girl at that Bible study out to lunch. That's her goal. Like, that's just who she is. She loves that. My goal is to never take anyone to lunch, okay? Just sit at home and study, okay? And, and it used to make me feel really bad because I'm like, Chris, why are you so like that? And I'm so not like that. But it made me realize that we, everybody has different gifts, uh, different abilities. Uh, some of us are hands and feet and ears and mouths and noses and whatever. Everyone's different. And, and when I thought about that this morning, I thought, we also have to remember that, like right now, I have, a, I have a hurt arm, okay? I don't know what's wrong with it. I've been to the doctor probably four times in my life for this stupid arm. It's getting worse. In the morning, I can hardly move it. I can hardly lift it. It's just really stupid. And so my right hand has to always help my left arm. So anytime I have to do something, I, this one will have to help. And that's what us as the body is. We're all the body. We all have different jobs and we have to help one another. That's why I think I hate the gossip thing so much because I think we should be the people that are coming alongside of the people that we're talking about and saying, what can I do to help you? I, you're, we're on, in the same body. We need help. So we need to uplift one another. Now, I don't even think no, we have much time. I don't know how I got off on all this. We have four minutes. That's really obnoxious. Um, I want to get to the end really quick. I'm going to miss. We're going to do 1 Thessalonians 5, 14 through 22. We're not going to do that. You can go through that. That's just something that says being a Christian is really hard to do. God calls us to do a lot of things. Be nice to people. Pray always. The Holy Spirit is going to give us the, the ability. But... I want to talk real quick and end with the whole idea about quenching the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is available to you and I. He comes into our life when we become a Christian, but now what are we going to do with him? Because we have the ability to quench him, to ignore him, to disobey him, to refuse to follow him. Those are our choices in our life. And so I look at it like we have this pipeline to God. And, and so 
that it, it's clear, it should be clear. But when we sin, we disobey God, it clogs that line up, and now we don't have the ability to hear from God and have the power that we can have if there's unresolved things that are in our life. We, we quench it. So if I, like just this happened yes, two days ago. W- yesterday, we're on our way to take Dusty to this basketball thing. He's got this little trainer thing after school. And so we pick him up. We're running there. He goes, do you have my basketball stuff? I'm like, no, you're supposed to have your basketball stuff. I thought I left it in my car. Okay, well, now we're way behind. We'll be 30 minutes late. I'm frustrated with him. I'm like, you need to be more responsible. This is ridiculous, blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, then I felt really bad. He looked at me, he goes, Mom, you forget things too, which I did. I had to go back home this morning because I forgot stuff, okay? So I get that, but I yelled at him. And I realized that if I want to have that clear line to God, I need to apologize to him and I need to make it right with him. And I, I said, Desi, I'm so sorry. I'm going to yell at you. I'm just frustrated with the situation. So it's really all our choice to be able to do that. I, I don't want that, that line clogged. Um, the other thing I want to tell you, I cannot believe we're, I don't know how I talked too much on something this morning, but geez, um, here's the deal. We have a flesh. You're going to have to read Romans 7 on your own. Paul says, I do the things that I don't want to do, and I don't do the things I want to do. So constantly in our life, we're going to be fighting our flesh with the spirit. The Holy Spirit says do something. Our flesh says we don't want to. Constant, constant fighting. And then when we realize that, we need to pray. Uh, my, my mom, my mother-in-law was, in, she's been, I told you, uh, she was in a mental health hospital for elderly people trying to get her meds squared away. And the first day I went there, I was like, Rob, I don't even want to go. Like, I don't, a, I don't do babies very well, and I clearly don't do mental elderly people very well. It just, it's not in my deal. I, I'm not a very compassionate, merciful person, I guess. So it didn't, doesn't work for me. After about the second time there, I was saying, I get to go see grandma tomorrow. It's my turn. I get to go. And suddenly God took me and changed me to where I looked forward to going. I wanted to hug her. I wanted to tell her it was okay. I wanted to say hello to her neighbor and and just be there for her. And I can assure you that is not me, not me. So I know that the Holy Spirit came into my life and said, I'm going to change this about you. I'm going to give you some compassion because that's his job to do. Now, I want to end with this, this. I heard this from Mark Driscoll, and it was the best thing I ever heard. He said, it's kind of like, we're like sailboats, okay? And when we when we're free from sin and our, our line is unclogged, it's like our sail is up, and we're sailing. And the Bible even uh, says the Holy Spirit is like the wind. So when God wants to work in your life and he wants to work in my life, our sail has to be up in order to do that. But when we sin and we don't apologize for things and we're rebelling against God, our sail goes down. And the Holy Spirit, when he wants to change us, he really can't because the sail's down. So our, our job in our life is to make sure that that sail stays up. And sometimes that means we have to look within ourselves because I can blame Rob for a whole lot of things in our marriage when in fact I need to look at myself. I can blame my kids when I have to look at myself. So in order to to go through this life and let the Holy Spirit change us, that sail has to be up. But that means we have to deal with a lot of stuff in our life. God, what am I doing in my marriage? What am I doing? Change me. Let's quit worrying about everybody else. Let's worry about us. Okay, I don't even know how we missed half this lesson. I'm sorry, I either have to start early or don't put so much stuff in there. So anyway, just know this, we're filled with the Spirit. It's not something that happens. We're we're filled once, and then, I mean, He comes into our life, and then the filling part of it is dependent really on us confessing our sins and moving on. And I just want us to be little sailboats with our sails up, okay, so that God can teach us what He wants us to know.